Come on, let's give the Lord one more hand clap today. Anybody glad to be alive in 2019, huh? Got another year to hang out together. Why don't you turn to your neighbor sitting by you and tell them you look like you're about to lose 20 pounds. Tell them that, huh? Talking about prayer and fasting. How many of y'all need to shed a winter coat? I know I need to shed my winter coat. Thank God for January. Hey, it's good to see you today. I'm, I'm excited about this next week. We're going to enter into a time of corporate prayer and fasting. Right there's where you erupt into applause and everybody's so excited because we're not going to, we're not going to eat for a week. Amen. I just, uh, I just walked through uh, the, the back room where the worship team was and the amount of sugary carbs they have piled up on a table has got to be some sort, it's, it's condemned in the Levitical law in the Old Testament. I promise you it is. Hey, I want to I want to pray and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about prayer and fasting today. Uh, we do this at the beginning of the year every year. It's been our custom for many years now uh, to set apart a time where we intensely seek God and believe God for his blessing on our new year. So let's pray before we move into that. And I believe God's going to do something exceedingly abundantly above in all of our lives in 2019. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the power of prayer. I thank you for the weapon you've given us. Lord, we don't just have carnal weapons. We have spiritual weapons. And the Bible says they're mighty. And Lord, right now, I thank you for a revelation of the power of prayer and fasting. Let it come into this church. Let it come into my brothers and sisters. Let it catapult us to a new level together. Lord, I thank you that a new discipline and a new uh, movement by your spirits coming into many of our lives right now. I thank you that people are going to grow up to a level they've never thought they'd grow up to before. I thank you that you're going to mature us in the faith. I thank you that hang-ups and addictions and, and insecurities and those carnal things are going to be broken off of our life this coming week and this month, and you're going to get all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise in Jesus' mighty name. And the church said... Amen. Amen. If you have your Bible on you today, I want you to go ahead and open it up to the book of Daniel. We'll go to the book of Daniel and uh, going to read a couple of passages out of there. Whenever I'm talking about prayer and fasting, really, whenever I think about prayer and fasting in the scripture, two names come to my mind before almost any other name. And the first name is Jesus. Jesus, how many know Jesus himself, he fasted. He did a 40 day fast before he entered into his ministry, a 40-day water fast. Just go ahead and turn to your neighbor and say, I think God's calling you to that. I'm, uh, not me, but you. A uh, 40-day water fast, right? Before he entered into his ministry. So Jesus said these kind of things about fasting. He said, when you pray. He didn't say, if you pray. Everybody say, when you. He said, uh, when you give. He didn't say, if you give. He said, when you. Everybody say, when you. And he said, when you fast. He didn't say, if you fast. He said, what did he say, church? When you, Jesus set a model of prayer and fasting, and uh, he told us how to do it, how the attitude and the spirit to do it in, and there's times for private prayer, private giving, private fasting. There's also times all throughout the New Testament, a lot of people don't know this, all throughout the book of Acts, after Jesus said those things, there were corporate times of prayer, corporate times of giving, and corporate times of fasting. So there's a time for you to fast, pray, and give privately where nobody knows about it. And then there's a time for you to fast, give, and, and uh, pray corporately. How many think it's all right for us to pray together? Come on, we think that's all right. Why do people have a problem whenever you talk about calling a fast? They did it all throughout the book of Acts. It's just the church in America has lost what it means to pray and fast. And thank God God's put an emphasis on it for the last 10 years in America. And God's given a power back to the church we'd lost. Somebody give God a hand clap for that kind of power he's put in our midst. So Jesus fasted. If Jesus needed to fast or chose to fast, how many believe that we as Christians ought to fast like our Lord and Savior did at some time? Somebody say amen to that. Second person I think about, I think about Jesus first when I talk about prayer and fasting. Second person I think about when I, I talk about prayer and fasting or think about it, I think about Daniel. Daniel is a guy that's in a very tough situation. So we go to Daniel uh, chapter 1 here. And so Israel has been sacked. They've been taken over by an a unbelievably powerful and wicked nation, a, a kingdom there that took them over because of Israel's own wickedness and rebellion against God was written, and Israel was warned many, many times, if you serve me, I'll bless you. But if you serve other gods, there'll be a foreign people that'll come and invade you, and you'll become their servants instead of my servants. Israel rebels against the plan of God, and so invaders come. And these are a very tough people called the Babylonians. 
And what they would do is they would go and they would take the best, the brightest, the smartest, the strongest, the best looking young leaders out of every nation. They would bring them to themselves. And the king of that nation would use them almost like, excuse me, the Persians did this, almost like uh, his trophy room. His gods he saw then as greater than any of the other gods of the nations because he had their best recruits. He got the best kind of recruits on his team. And so Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would be the name the pagans gave them. Um, they were the brightest people. They were the future of Israel. And then they were taken to serve this foreign king. Before they could go into full service of this foreign king, they had to be trained in his school for a period of time. They had to learn the ways of their captors. And that brings us to our text this morning, Daniel chapter 1, verses 8 through 15. If you're there this morning, go ahead and say, "Uh uh-huh. Here's what it says, verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mizael, and Azariah, please test your servants for ten days, and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearances be examined before you, and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this matter and tested them ten days. And at the end of ten days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh. Some of you said, "Uh, uh, my Lord, we're going to fast and I'm going to look fatter at the end of it. I hope not, all right? Uh, Then all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. So here's what happens. They bring all of these different guys in from all of these different nations, and they're training them in the ways of this king's delight, and there's Jewish boys in there. Now, I don't know if you know a lot about Jewish dietary restrictions, but there's all sorts of things written in the Old Testament law that a Jewish man could eat or a Jewish man who was observant could not eat. There were things like pork. You're not going to stand by an observant Jew at moonlight over the pork. He's not going to be in on that. He doesn't get to eat lobster rolls or shrimp cocktails or crabs. I, I don't know, but I'm, I'm thankful for the grace of God that lets us Gentiles, saved by grace, eat it all. Somebody give God a hand clap for his mercy because I like pork ribs and I like lobster and I like shrimp cocktails. Somebody say amen out there. I like that kind of thing. But these guys, during their time of grace, they couldn't eat such a thing. To eat such a thing would be to defile yourself as an observant Jew, a person of faith. So they walk in, and the king, the most powerful king in the world, has laid out a spread for these boys to eat. Think about it. You've been in captivity. Your life has been tough. You're brought in here. You came from Israel. Israel's been sacked. And now the best-looking feast is laid out in front of you that's ever been seen anywhere around, your eyes have ever seen. I'm talking about they're looking at a spread like at a Ritz-Carlton somewhere. They can't believe what their eyes have seen. And they walk up to the table and they start looking around what's laid out on that table. And then they see that there's all sorts of things on the table that would defile them if they were to eat what's on the table of the king of this world. Do you know what the king of this world, the Bible says the king of this world, the king of this fallen world we live in, the prince of the power of the air is the devil Beelzebub or Lucifer. You know, the king of this world often brings the servants of God to a table that he's laid out before us. And it may look good to your eye when you first walk up to it, but I'm going to tell you that there's death on every one of the plates of the king of this world. And that what Christians need to be is we need to be as wise as Daniel as his three friends whenever we walk up to the delicacies of this world. We ought to look at them and say, listen, if God said I can't have it right now, I won't touch it. And we ought to purpose in our heart just like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego purpose that we're not going to defile ourselves. We're not going to touch something that the God of this world is dishing out. Come on, somebody give God a good hand clap. You believe that's the kind of people we ought to be? We ought to be a different people with a different spirit, with a different way of living, walking, and talking. Somebody say amen to that. I love this about these guys. They purposed in their heart. Come on, everybody say purpose in my heart. 
One of the strongest ways to live as a Christian is we live on purpose. We have a purpose in our heart. We have a way we're going to live, what we're going to do. I'll tell you how you overcome the temptations of this world. You don't wait till you get in front of them to decide what you're going to do. You purpose in your heart before you ever get there that I'm not going to defile myself with what the world's selling. Somebody say amen to that. I think way back, 20 years ago, when I first got born again, I first got saved, got saved out of the world. I was a party kid and just almost nothing off limits back then and uh, got born again and I was around a group of Christian people in the church yet they were my age and they lived so differently than anybody I'd ever been around lived in my age group. It's literally like they were from a different world or a different planet. I used that language back then. I told Jesse, it was some of Jesse's friends. I said, honey, it's like your, your friends. I didn't call her honey back then because she just slapped me. I wasn't dating her then. But uh, it's 20 years of calling her honey now, I guess. So I said, it's like your friends are from a different world. I don't speak their language. I don't understand them. I, 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 the guys that would be around didn't have anything to talk to with them about it because they were clean and I was unclean in so many ways. And uh, I just, it was like they were from somewhere else. And one thing I noticed amongst the Christian kids that I couldn't find in the world where I was hanging out is that they had a, uh, they really had a high standard of sexual purity that I hadn't been around in the world. Now I'm talking about 20 years ago. And the standards of sexual purity in America, how many know 20 years ago we were all like so much more cleaner living than it is now? Somebody say amen to that. Internet's changed everything about that. And I watched in the way they had, they had purposed in their heart the way they would live when it came to those standards was so different. I went and uh, I heard a guy preaching, and he was preaching about this. His name was Ed Cole. He was no, a leader. He's went on to be with the Lord now. They preached about those kind of standards in your life. And I took a vow uh, at one of his services that I wouldn't touch a woman until I, I got married as a Christian. And I'll tell you, whenever I purposed in my heart to take that vow, Everything changed. Come on, somebody say purpose. And uh, I tell this story. One day after I purpose in my heart, every vow you take will be tested, by the way. I, uh, I'm hanging out at my apartment. I have an apartment. I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing right. I'm by myself in my apartment, Amarillo, Texas, 21, 22-year-old guy, somewhere in there. And all of a sudden, there's a knock on, on my door at that apartment. Now I go and I look out the people to see who's at my door. I was in there listening to a preacher. Rod Parsley was a big deal back then. I was listening to him, and he was preaching and sweating, kind of like I'm doing right now, and I was into it. Knock on the door. I go and look out of the people, and I'll tell you who I saw out of the people when I looked out of it. I looked out of the people, and one of the Bond girls had literally one of the Bond girls had showed up at my, at my door. And uh, I'm like, holy moly, there's a bond, bond girl at my door out here. What's happened? And uh, I'll tell you it wasn't a Bond girl. I'll tell you who it was. It was the devil. I mean, no, the devil doesn't show up with goat leggings and horns on anymore. They show up saying something like, bro, babe, friend, buddy, let me come in. Somebody say amen to that. That's what the devil does, how he shows up. So I opened the door. I'd already purposed in my heart I wouldn't defile myself. I opened the door and I said, can I help you? And it became obvious there after a few minutes that the girl wanted to come in and she had some things on her mind that I didn't need on my mind. She's like, uh, uh, can I come in and, and hang out with you a little bit? And uh, she'd had a fight with her boyfriend across the hallway, came to get even with him. And, and I looked at my watch, she's standing there. Man, I'd already purposed in my heart I wasn't gonna do something wrong. I wasn't gonna touch a woman until I got married. And the best I could figure out was to lie to her. So I, I looked up at her and I said, I'm sorry, I got to be somewhere. And I left and I went and got in my car and drove off and I didn't come home for like 24 hours to make sure she was gone. And I needed to be anywhere she wasn't. Come on, somebody. How I many know once you purposed in your heart, you're not going to do something that gives you the power to come through on the future. I think God's calling us to purpose in our heart at a new level in many different ways for 2019 because God's got something bigger for all of us, something greater for all of us, something bolder for all of us, something of more kingdom significance for all of us. 2019, I think, is a key year for many people in this room. Somebody say amen to that. So these guys purpose in their heart they're not going to eat anything off the king's table. And they, they make a deal. They say, let us just drink water and eat vegetables. And the guy says, listen, you'll cost me my life. If you guys don't look good whenever you're checked out with the other guys, the guy that was in charge of them all, the king will take my head off. They had a reputation of doing that. 
And so Daniel made a deal. He said, here's the deal. You let us just eat vegetables and drink water for 10 days. And then you test us and see what God will do. And so the guy said, okay, you got 10 days. We'll try And after the end of 10 days, they came back and tested them. And Daniel and his three buddies looked better than anybody else in the program because that's the power of a person who will live with purpose. You always rise above the people who have no purpose in life. And so they got to do what they needed to do for the rest of the program. And I believe that what it did, as a matter of fact, at the end of that program, by the way, Daniel and his friends, they turned out 10 times sharper, 10 times stronger, 10 times better. I believe there's a 10 times anointing that will come on your life and 10 times the favor, 10 times the grace if you'll live a life of purpose, prayer, and fasting. Let's give God a hand clap for that this morning. A 10 times blessing. That's what I want on our 2019. So it set these guys up to be people of prayer and fasting for the rest of their life. I think it really impressed them. How many of y'all can remember, many of you out there, y'all remember the first time you ever really went on a fast? Let me see some hands out there. Ever really went on it and the power that it kind of released into your life. See, once you have an experience like that, uh, it just changes you from the inside out. When you see God move, when you do what, what the Word of God says, and you see God move in a supernatural way, now you have an experience You have uh, uh, this this grace experience with God that changes who you are and how you operate. And I believe that many of you are going to step across the line by faith. You're going to fast over the next week in some shape, form, or fashion. And you're going to have a similar uh, uh, result of the glory and grace of God as Daniel did here in in the Old Testament. See, Daniel becomes this guy of fasting. These four guys that make this decision. These are guys that were placed in a ferning, a, a fiery furnace, and they come out without being burnt. These guys become men who can interpret dreams and have wisdom and revelation nobody else has. God gives them supernatural knowledge because of their prayer and their fasting. Daniel himself was thrown into a lion's den because of his lifestyle of prayer and fasting, and the lion laid down like a lamb, and he came out without being touched by the lion. I'm telling you, these guys get elevated, and they become the leaders of a society in many ways that they're a stranger to because of the power of prayer and fasting. Daniel chapter 10, you'll find another. You ought to read Daniel chapter 10 this afternoon, all right? The, the, Daniel, I'll, I'll sum it up because I'm short on time, but Daniel, later on in life, he's an older man at this point of the story. He's on up, scholars say, probably in his 80s or 90s. And he's down by a river where he's been serving. And he has this revelation, this unbelievable revelation of what's coming. He has this vision that that freaks him out. He sees war. He sees bloodshed. He sees all of these problems. And so Daniel doesn't know what to do about it, so he goes on a fast. And Daniel's got to have some mind and some ability He's one of the head satraps of his entire nation, and so he's got to be able to think somewhat. So he decides that he's going to fast for for three weeks, for 21 days. This is what a Daniel fast looks like, okay? If If you've never heard of a Daniel fast or don't know what it was, he said for three weeks he decided, he purposed that he wouldn't uh, drink any fruit of the vine, to have no wine, nothing good to drink. Second thing he would do is he would eat no meat. Everybody say no meat. He ate no meat for 21 days. And the third thing he didn't do is he ate no pleasant bread. He had no ho-hos, he had no ding-dongs, he had no uh, toasted, buttered white bread, I'm sure. He had nothing good to eat. He goes on a minimal diet, probably some water, vegetables, and and some sort of very common uh, bread, if he had any at all. And and for, for 21 days, he fasts and prays and seeks God. At the end of his 21 days of fasting, seeking God and praying, All of a sudden, he has an angelic encounter. What fasting does is fasting sets you up for spiritual breakthrough at another level. And an angel shows up and begins to deliver to him what happened. He said, from the moment you started to pray, I was was released to come to you. But he said a demonic force in the world prohibited him from getting there. And as Daniel kept praying, fasting, other angels were released to help this angel overcome the camp of the enemy. I'm telling you, as we pray and fast over the next week, God's going to release angelic forces to overcome the camp of the enemy and his assignment against your life. That's the power of prayer and fasting. The angel shows up and he calls Daniel greatly beloved. I believe a person that will pray and fast and seek God is somebody who God has a special place in his heart for. See, God loves us all, 
But I'm telling you, some people have a favor about them that other people don't have. Come on, somebody. And I think it's that lifestyle of devotion and prayer and fasting that can put a favor on you that the world can't touch. That's the power of prayer and fasting. So Daniel gets supernatural revelation then. The angel starts explaining to him about what he saw. Here's some benefits I want to give you. If you're taking notes, I want you to write these down about fasting benefits over this next week. These are benefits I believe we're going to see. Number one is fasting puts an edge on your life. Come on, everybody say an edge. I believe that you can do life dull. You can hit a tree with a baseball bat maybe hundreds of thousands of times and get that tree to turn over eventually after you broke your hand and beat yourself up. You could probably beat a tree down if you were committed enough over the course of your life with a bat. But how many of you think taking a tree down instead of working with a bat, how many of y'all would rather work with a chainsaw? Come on, somebody say amen. And uh, you can do twice, you could do a thousand times more in the same amount of time. I've found that fasting puts an edge on my life that I don't have whenever I'm not given to prayer and fasting. Now, I'm not talking about fasting every day. You look at me, you can tell I like feasting a whole lot more than I like fasting. But there's a time you set it apart, and you say, hey, we're going to sanctify it. And we always do it at the first time of the year, corporately. We fast like this. Sometimes we'll do it a couple times, depending on the year and what we're facing. But um, it really is. It's a time of devoting myself to God. And early on in the year, I like to have an intense time of fasting, an intense time of prayer, and an intense time of giving. Those three things, just like Jesus said, the when you's, when you pray, when you fast, when you give. I try to do it at the first of the year, and, and over this week, we're going to pray and we're going to fast together. Every morning, we'll be in here at 6.30 a.m., and we'll have like a 30 to 45 minute prayer meeting before we go to work in here. There'll be worship, there'll be music, we'll pray, we'll seek God. How many think our church could get stronger if we could get up and pray together and seek the will and the voice and the help? The, the anointing. Come on, let's really give God a hand clap if you believe in the power of prayer, the power of fasting. Then Saturday of this coming week, we'll pray in here at 9 o'clock. We'll, we'll sleep in on Saturday. We'll pray together at 9 a.m. But fasting puts an edge on your life. Second thing fasting does is fasting raises the level of spiritual authority in your life. Fasting raises the level of spiritual authority in your life. Jesus' disciples, they go and they try to cast a devil. There's a, there's a kid that's demon-possessed. They're trying to minister to this family and get that demon to come out of this kid. And no matter what they tried, they couldn't get the demon to come out of the child. So they go back to the master and they say, Master, uh, you know, they come and they say, your, your disciples, they can't get the devil out. And so then Jesus shows up and he rebukes the devil and the devil comes out of the child. And the, the followers of Christ, they ask him this question. How come you can get the, the devil to come out, but we can't? Jesus offers this explanation. He says, this kind only comes out with prayer and with fasting. Everybody say prayer and fasting. Uh, there's some authority and some breakthroughs I think you're not going to get in life in, in different ways unless you give yourself to prayer and fasting. Jesus walked up and he had an authority they didn't have. How did he start his ministry? He started his ministry with a 40-day water fast out in the desert. That'll, that'll get you some spiritual authority. He's also anointed by the Father, Son of God. But he attributed that power to prayer and fasting. There's authority. I love the story. One of my, one of my friends that's given his life to teaching on prayer and fasting, uh, traveled, ministered with him, preached the gospel with him around the world, Dr. Bob Rogers up in Louisville, and uh, a lot of what you see in America right now, when people talk about the 21-day fast, guys preach it, talk about it, they've written books about it. There's churches all over America that are doing this right now. Well, that all came out of Evangel in Louisville, Kentucky, was the epicenter of that in America right now. And uh, kind of they restored an emphasis to that. Other guys like Jensen Franklin's got a great book on fasting. He learned that, that those uh, revelation pretty much from, from the church in Louisville. And I've heard Dr. Bob talk about the, the first time he went to Korea, to Dr. Cho's church. If you don't know who Dr. Cho was and is, he's, a, he's an older gentleman, retired now. But Dr. Cho built a church in Seoul, Korea of a million believers. Come on, somebody. We ought to give God a hand clap right there. A million, a million member church in a nation when he started that was 3% Christian. 3% Christian when he started. Now Korea is up in, in the 30s percent Christian. That's how, how many conversions happen. 
And if you see the Korean Christians pray and fast, you'll see where their power comes from. And I've uh, been there. I've seen it. I've seen it firsthand. I've seen 80, 100,000 of them praying together. Where to get them to stop praying, you got to ring bells to get them to quit praying. They start praying so fervently. And, and he was there with, with Dr. Cho. His father was there. Dr. Rogers was there as a younger guy. And uh, they're looking. Everybody was coming to see why this church was growing so fast. And so they ask. They start to ask, hey, tell me, um, what's the secret to your church growing? And, and so Wayman Rogers, Bob's dad, was asking that question. And, and an old, older, older Korean lady, you got to love this about the Koreans. They call it like they see it a lot of times. If you can't handle that, don't go to Asia. Look at your neighbor and say, just don't go to Asia, right? I've, I, I'll walk in to buy something sometime. I'll be ministering in Southeast Asia. And I'll walk through the door. They'll look at me. They say, you too fat. You know, I'm like, praise the Lord. <laughs> all right, all right. I got a word for you too, lady. <laughs> anyway, uh, they, 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 look at, uh, they look at him, says, how do we grow our church? How do you get it to happen? And, and they, she looks, and these are the words she says. She points at him, and she says, pray, pray, pray. And then she points at his belly and says, fast, fast, fast. And he didn't think he, she understood, you know, that there was some kind of translation barrier. And he asks again, and she does it again. Pray, 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 and fast, fast, fast. Come on, everybody say, pray, pray, pray. Now say, fast, fast, fast. See, it raises this authority in your life because of that regions have been changed third thing i think that fasting does is fasting sets the stage for breakthrough in your life fast how many of y'all want to see some breakthroughs in your life in 2019 anybody want to see god really do something in your midst 2019 i want to see it i, I think of the things that i've seen god do at, at the end of a fast we couldn't get done any other way we're looking for a building years ago man we didn't have the money we were a young church didn't have any way to get in somewhere. You know, it's, it's always been a, a fight of faith. Financially, sometimes people look at a church that's a little larger in their city than other churches, and they think it must be easy. No, typically, you're always stretched. You're always strapped. You're always believing God. Now, I just want to take a moment. Let's give, let's give everybody a hand clap that takes care of this place financially. You don't know how much you really do whenever you take care of a church financially. I want to thank you. But uh, we're, we're fasting and praying, and I, we, we had every door closed in front of us. You could possibly get to close. We bought, some, bought a piece of land back in the day over here, still own it off J.R. Miller, and um, we were told we could zone it and have the entrances we wanted. We got the nod, but we didn't get it in writing. Look at your neighbor and tell them always get it in writing. I learned a hard lesson. And then after we purchased it and spent our money, they said, no, you can't have the entrances you want. So it was going to be a legal battle for the church. And one of the first things I didn't want to do as a pastor is sue our city. You know, it didn't seem, I'm not above it, but I didn't want to do it, right? Uh, and so we went on a fast. And there was a year where we probably fasted. I mean, we, we did 21-day fasts like, I don't know, I did like three times that year. Just believe in God, I needed a breakthrough. So you'd see me, I'd weigh 240, then I'd weigh 192. It's just the way it was every, every few months that year. But at the end of that time of fasting, God opened up this building for us to get it where it didn't even make sense. We, we really barely got into it, got it done. But I'm telling you, it was a result part. It was, it was breakthrough from prayer and fasting of the people of God. Come on, let's give God a hand clap. That fasting puts that power. I remember this. I fought a battle with, with ear pain uh, and ear infections for like 18 months the same time in my life. It was recurring. I couldn't sleep at night. Had so much pain. I think it's because I moved from other part of the country. I grew up an hour south of here. But I mean, no, we got pollen at another level down here uh, by this river. And uh, I'd rather fight devils than pollen. I, I feel like I got better authority over a devil than I do pollen. But, but I had this ear infections just kept coming. I had ear pain all the time. And uh, it's hard to be nice whenever you hurt all the time. And, and so I, I was taking Claritin and that kind of stuff back then that wired me up and just put, made me uh, uh, not the best version of myself. And I went on a fast, believing God. God spoke to me and said, I'll heal you of that if you fast. And I did a 21-day fast. And I went on that 21-day fast, came off of it. The pain left in my ears, and I haven't had an ear infection that I can remember since. That's been like eight years ago after 18 months of a constant ear infection. I'm telling you, you get breakthrough in so many different ways when you give yourself to prayer and fasting. Jesse and I also, to a similar time in life, we had our first child. We had Briley. 
and uh, we wanted a, a, a second child. And we tried for several years, and it just just wasn't wasn't happening. Finally, it, it happened, and we miscarried a baby, and it was real like one of those things, you know, a, a punch in the gut. Many of you have been through that, and uh, still wasn't happening. And so I went on a fast, and I fasted for a son. And I'm telling you, he's nine years old, and he's back in the kids' ministry this morning. The power of prayer and fasting sets you up for breakthrough in your life. See, I believe that fasting also, next thing I'll tell you it does is it quiets the distractions of the world. How many know our God is often speaking, but we are seldom listening? Our God is often speaking. Come on, somebody. But we're seldom listening. One of the strongest ways you can, you can turn off the distractions of the world is you just put away the table for a moment. You'd be shocked to find out how, how committed we are to the flesh and food and what we're doing. It's kind of funny. We're so committed. You even watch people. We'll, we'll do a Daniel's fast or Christians are talking about that more than they used to. We started fasting like this. Nobody, nobody talked about it out there in America. People looked at you like you had two heads when you went on a fast back then. But um, now it's like kind of in vogue to, to fast in January amongst Christian circles. And people will start posting like, Daniel fast to prove recipes. <laughs> and there'll be this wonderful looking dishes that they've worked all week on putting together. And it's like, I kind of think you're missing the point of the fast now, right? The point of the fast is to not be fixated on food for a while, but to be fixated on Jesus instead of food. It's not a fad diet, it's a focus on Jesus. And so you can put down this distraction and you can get your focus on what really matters. Over the next seven days, man, we're going to realign our focus. We're going to focus on Him, and His voice is going to come to you. I'm telling you, some of you, it's like you've been in a desert. Some of you have been in a desert for like 18 months. You say, it's like I can't feel God, I can't hear God. When I pray, it's like there's a brass heaven. It's like I used to be so connected, but the water's been turned off in my life. And the Spirit of God says to you, if you'll give yourself to prayer and fasting these next seven days, the heavens are going to open over you again. You're going to hear the voice of God. The voice of the enemy and that distraction is going to be driven out of your life. God's going to rise and your enemies are going to be scattered. I declare it over your life in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Listen, it's, it's focusing on him for a season. We're going to focus on him. Would you stand up on your feet with me for one second? Here's what I want to do. I want to bring you to a time where we're going to commit uh, something to fast. Let me tell you what fasting is and what fasting isn't, okay? We'll start with what it isn't. Fasting is not abstinence. Some people will say things like this, well, I'm going to fast cable and I'm only going to watch Netflix this week. I'm like, slow down, martyr. All right, calm down a little bit. Uh, it's, like, it's like the fast where, hey, we, we eat fish sandwiches on Friday. That's not a fast, all right? That's not what it is. Uh, so what fasting is, it's not not watching people say, I'm going to fast television. It's great to abstain from television. Look at your neighbor and say, that's not a fast. Just tell them that. It's not a fast. Fasting is giving up food, all right? It's a biblical definition. There's no other way around it. It's giving up food. Uh, when you're pregnant, Catherine, you don't, have to, you don't have to be a part of this, all right? Jesse stayed pregnant for a lot of years, so she didn't have to fast with me. She really did. Uh, so, so here's what it is. It's giving up food. Here's the ways you can fast, all right? Uh, number one, you can go on a water fast, and that's nothing. I'm not having anything but water. And on the water fast, you can have bottled water. You can have tap water. You can have ice, you can have ice cubes, chipped ice, you know. You can have a lot of different forms of water, but that's all, that's all you have. And uh, some people are like, I'll die if I do that. Uh, unless there's something, check with your doctor, but you got something really medically wrong with you. You can, go a, you can go a lot longer than you think without eating. I promise you that. And after like three or four days, you don't even care anymore. It's like you, you get to where you're not hungry. Smelling food's good enough until you get up somewhere around 20 days and you get really hungry again. Uh, you can go longer, so without water. Second kind of fast I've done a lot of times, just coaching a little bit about fasting, is a juice fast. Everybody say juice. You can drink different juices. You got to be careful with that because I think it's harder sometimes to uh, juice fast than it is to water fast because you get enough nutrients to stay hungry after three or four days. And a lot of times the sugar, juice has so much sugar in it, you has got to be careful with that kind of thing, but, but that's a way to fast. Third kind of fast is a Daniel fast. Everybody say a Daniel fast. Talk to you about that. That's, that's nothing good to drink, 
No fruit of the vine, no meat, and no pleasant bread. It's a diet of like water and vegetables is really what it comes down to. That's what a Daniel's fast is. Some, some real low-level breads, but nothing that's good or anything like that. That's what Daniel ate for his fast. The other kind of fast you could do is a partial fast. So that is, I'm going to fast. Um, sometimes there's, uh, the, the Jews at times are going to fast where you, you only ate at a certain time of the day. Had these many hours a day where, where you would eat. Or you only eat one meal or, 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 or two meals, but you don't eat anything after noon or something like that. Um, I'll say this, if you're working hard, real tough labor or something, it's kind of hard to do an extended water fast if you're, if you're building houses or something really, really physical. Uh, but the rest, the rest of you, you know, if it's, if it's kind of uh, not physically strenuous labor, you can fast longer than you can. Tell you what, we're going to have a powerful time of prayer and fasting this week. If y'all believe that, give the Lord a hand clap this morning. It's going to be awesome. Hey, I want to just ask you, how many of you out there say, hey, for the next seven days, Pastor, till we come back together, I'm going to start mine tonight. Uh, I'll start mine tonight. I'm going, to, I'm going to go eat everything that's not nailed down for like the next four hours. I've been doing it for the last three months. I get nervous in October every year because I know January is coming, right? I start eating. So uh, what, what, how many of y'all, I just want to ask you, how many of y'all say, Pastor, I want to fast corporately with us as a church? Put a little peer pressure on you right now. Come on, let me see your hands out there. All right, you boys on the cameras, y'all got them all right now? You got them? We got your commitment right now. And uh, how you fast, I don't care. That's up to you, right? That's between you and the Lord. I just want us to fast and pray together because I believe that there's a power when we do things together that's next level. Hey, I want to pray over you that just y'all, y'all just made that commitment. Lift that hand back to heaven. I'm going to pray that God would give us great grace, great wisdom, that he'd help us. Father, I pray right now for the people under the sound of my voice. I thank you that you've called us to something supernatural. And Lord, that you're going to give us a grace to see it through. Lord, I thank you for revelation, knowledge, for help from heaven. I thank you for new spiritual authority. I thank you for breakthrough. I thank you for the, the, the voice of God coming to my brothers and sisters this week. Lord, I pray that you would set us up in this 2019 for a year of power, for a year of breakthrough, for a year of authority, for a year of the help of God. I speak the blessing of God over every person. And Lord, I thank you that you're going to give them new revelation and new comfort in you more than they've ever had before in Jesus mighty name and the church said amen 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 come on let's give God one more hand clap this morning